The Neglected and Abused, A Physician's Year in Haiti, written by Joseph F. Bentuvegna, M.D. This was written in 1991. We have the preface. Upon completing my internship, I did something I had always wanted to do. I worked in a third world country as a physician, helping the poor with the skills I had studied long and diligently to acquire. I chose Haiti, which is located in the Caribbean, a few hundred miles southeast of Florida. It is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, with many people dying unnecessarily from tuberculosis, malaria, and diarrhea. I felt that Haiti needed more doctors to work with these eminently treatable diseases. I cured many. I saved more lives than physicians who practiced for a lifetime in the United States, but I came to realize I was fighting a losing battle. These diseases existed because of overpopulation, malnutrition, poor sanitation, and ignorance, and I was doing nothing to address these problems. Rather than leave in despair, I continued to work and I wrote this book. I hope it will encourage others to help this poor but wonderful country. Introduction <clears throat> To help developing countries is no mere largesse. What better investment can the North make in its own future than by turning today's deprived South into tomorrow's customers, Indira Gandhi? Why was I born in America? I could have been a blind beggar in India, a Cambodian child helplessly watching his parents be slaughtered, or a Haitian mother with six children, no husband, and pregnant. But no, when the biological dice rolled, I got double sixes. I was born in an American middle-class family where everything was handed to me. My major concern while growing up was whether or not the Yankees were winning. In college, I merely had to get good grades so that I could attend medical school. I never had to scrape for a meal or worry whether I had a place to sleep. No government police ever came to beat my parents, and when a president was accused of breaking the law, he was deposed without a shot being fired. For most of this planet's five billion inhabitants, this is not the case. One third goes to sleep hungry. They are ravaged by diseases which waste their bodies, causing slow, agonizing, and degrading deaths. They are frozen by ignorance, illiteracy, and insolvency in political and economic stru structures that offer them no chance to better their lives. When they are brutalized or have their homes confiscated, they have no recourse. These people live in the Third World, a group of non-industrialized nations located in Africa, Asia, and South America. With few exceptions, the resources and pleasures of this planet pass them by. While more Americans are buying graphite tennis rackets, Gucci clothes, and fine Bordeaux, the third world is sliding from an attitude of pessimism to abject despair. While our population growth is slowing, they continue to produce masses of people they can neither feed nor house. In the third world, many die from treatable diseases such as tuberculosis, malaria, and diarrhea. Even the healthy are not safe from the ravages of polio and tetanus because vaccinations are not available. While $100,000 is spent to prolong the life of an American who is obviously dying, those in the third world perish or are permanently crippled because a dollar's worth of medicine is unavailable. Before going to Haiti, I never understood why the third world was disintegrating. For example, number one, why can't we eradicate disease by sending more doctors? Number two, with contraception available, why are birth rates so high? And number three, why do we pay farmers not to grow food while starvation exists? With these questions in mind, I began to search for a third world country that needed my help. To my surprise, there were many opportunities. I could have worked in India, Pakistan, or El Salvador. But none of these countries is as poor as Haiti. My interest in Haiti was prompted by a Catholic priest, Father Normand Demers, a liberation theologian who espouses a controversial movement that stresses justice in the present life. Previously, the church told the poor to tolerate their lots so their rewards in heaven would be greater. He combined the gospel's message with our responsibility to alleviate poverty in the third world. Fluent in Spanish and French and having visited over 70 countries, he had an immense knowledge of the world's situation and a delightful variety of anecdotes. 
A man of five foot ten, he had a square jaw, carefully groomed, graying red hair, a pointed nose, and friendly but cautious eyes. Solidly built, he had a clear complexion, making him appear ten years younger than his actual age of fifty. He impressed me as someone who could easily have been a successful lawyer or politician, and I suspect his principled opinions prevented him from advancing in the church hierarchy. Over dinner, we discussed Haiti. He could arrange for me to work with two organizations in Haiti's capital, Port-au-Prince. One would be the Missionaries of Charity, the Order of Mother Teresa. The other was a non-sectarian Dutch organization that needed a doctor to run its clinic. Physicians frequently volunteer in Haiti, but few spend other than brief sojourns. Consequently, they never become familiar with its diseases, its culture, or its language, Creole. It was all arranged. His parish would sponsor me while I was a doctor in Haiti. I did have second thoughts, though. Haiti is truly a ravaged country. Once the most affluent colony of the French Empire, it now has mass starvation, rampant overpopulation, and an infant mortality rate of 15%. A large percentage of children die before age five. Various attempts by developed nations to assist have been met with continual frustration. Institutionalized corruption siphons off foreign aid, so the needy are never helped. High export taxes discourage peasants from growing popular crops while politically influential families make huge profits because they are exempt from paying taxes. 5% of the country mostly the mulatto elite, make 50% of the income, while the yearly per capita income is $300. Illiterate and superstitious, most Haitians eke out a day-to-day existence hustling everything from avocados to their own bodies. I would oversee two hospitals, one for adults and the other for children. Some patients just needed a place to stay because they had been crawling on the streets or had been rejected by other hospitals. Most were genuinely sick from diarrhea, tuberculosis, malaria, and other diseases. All had malnutrition. Medicine and simple equipment were available, having been sent by charities or donated by drug companies unable to market them. My job would be to determine which patients would benefit from medical care and then to see that they received proper treatment. Typically, my day began at the children's home where there were 50 children from infancy to age 10. Some were healthy and simply needed to eat, but others were sick and dying. After morning rounds, I drove to an outpatient clinic battling the aggressive Haitian drivers with my 70cc moped. I saw anywhere from 20 to 200 patients at the clinic. Here, I saved the most lives, either by explaining to a mother how to give electrolyte water to her dehydrated child, or by draining abscesses before they spread their poison through the body. Then, I traveled to the hospital for adults, or sans-fille, as it was called, after a nearby street. There were over 150 patients, most with tuberculosis. I helped the ones I could. Exhausted when the day ended, I returned to my apartment and wrote what I had seen. Overall, it was a great challenge. There were more patients than I could possibly have seen, and the more work I did, the more work I created. I established a vaccination program, which was successfully administered by two young men. I became an old-time family doctor, relying on instinct, judgment, physical exam, and the primitive laboratory tests that I performed. In one sense... It was the most satisfying experience of my life, but as time passed, I realized that people like me will not solve Haiti's problems. They can only be solved by the Haitians themselves.